I can think of only one person that I might um, allow to follow uh, Joseph O'Connor, and um, I'm delighted that she's going to be doing the next presentation before lunch. It is the last session before lunch, but it does require our very special attention. Because part of what the forum has been doing a lot of, particularly in the last year, is consultation around a national approach to professional development. And I know that all of you have a really vested interest in this part of the forum's work and that almost everyone in the room here has made a contribution, an important contribution, uh, to the emerging picture that um, Terry is going to paint for us today. Um, Dr. Terry Maguire, uh, most of you know her uh, by now. She's the director of the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education. She uh, grapples like no one I know with the complexities and perspectives of so many dynamics uh, to do with teaching and learning. And she's done that this year in particular uh, with the, the challenges around professional development in order to build an initial model uh, for Irish professional development, from which we will then be able to generate national guidelines. Um, remember that this is still a work in progress. Remember that what she's going to be presenting today brings together and tries to make sense of the diverse contributions that have been um, made from throughout the, the sector. Uh, and I, but I think Terry's another uh, powerful storyteller, and I think what she's going to do now is tell the story of what you told us and try to present it in a way that makes sense um, and will uh, give us um, a route for, for moving forward. So I'm delighted to welcome Terry to take us through where we are now with this. Thanks a million, Terry. Thanks a million, Sarah. I'm not sure I'm going to do it as well as Joseph O'Connor just did. <laughs> but let me tell you, when I arrived at the forum in uh, October 2013, uh, I was told I had two big jobs to do. I had to write a roadmap for building digital capacity for higher education, and we had to develop a professional development framework. No pressure then, first day on the job. I said, OK, so what do we do? We worked hard, and with the team, we did develop the roadmap for building digital capacity. We spent the first nine months uh, working, looking at professional development and what was happening internationally. We actually went, went to hear and to see what, how have other higher education systems tackled this issue. And then we realized that we didn't have any national data. We didn't really have a clear picture of what was already happening in the sector. So we took time to look nationally at the sector, at what the accredited professional development that was on offer, what non-accredited professional was, development was on offer, the, the, what was actually happening in the disciplinary groups. And we pulled it all together. And it culminated in the 10th of March with an actual a document on professional development for consultation. And that was only the start of the process. So what we did, Sarah and I went out and we actually met uh, 22, in 22 different institutions. We talked face to face with lecturers, with senior staff, with heads of department about professional development. And what was interesting about that, which was quite an iterative process, because when it actually started, we actually got some ideas from the conversation and we would integrate those ideas into the next conversation and the next conversation. We also opened up the consultation for submissions, and we got 41 submissions. So what we did with those was we, we read every one of them many times and said, what are the top 10 things you're saying to us through this submission? What are the key things for you that this professional development framework should have? I'm not sure we've got it right. We've done our best to try and interpret what you've said. I think one of our biggest lessons we learned was from our interviews with of existing professional development bodies. And we weren't interested in how their standards worked or anything like that. We said to them, how did you do it? And they gave us very good advice. They said, take very small steps and consult loads. So this morning is one of those small steps. What we've done is actually to try and interpret from all of this, these months of work what kind of a model of professional development would actually suit Irish higher education in our context. So what did you tell us? Well, the first thing we you told us, which was very insightful, was 
What types of professional development? What do you consider to be professional development? There was a strong voice for, please, don't have professional development considered as just something that's accredited. Remember the conversations we have in the tea rooms. Remember the conversations we have at events like this, talking to people. That is as important in terms of professional development. They said, don't forget that some of us have interests. And we have, for example, we may be interested in problem-based learning. We might have a particular technique that we use. We might be sort of sharing that, trying it out in our class. We go to conferences, we give papers, we, we share our ideas. Allow the framework to actually include that. Allow the framework to include all the, the, the structured accredited professional development that's offered through our institutions. And there's a huge amount currently being offered. And is there any potential for that to be able to be accredited in some way? So that's something that we need to consider. One of the other things that was very, very strong was you said, whatever we do, we need to make sure that Irish professional development is very values-based, that it has a very strong values base. And what was interesting was that there was, there was huge agreement about the values that should be included. So one of them, so you said they had to be inclusive. You had to recognize that the teaching population in higher education institutions now is quite diverse. There are people working full-time, there's people working part-time. There are learning technologists whose students are yourselves as staff. And the framework had got to be able to, to meet all of their needs. It had to be evidence-based and scholarly. Sarah Moore always says it had to be the, the anecdote to, no, the antidote to anecdote. Um, it had to be uh, authentic. There was a huge amount of you said, please don't make this something that's just tick box. This has to have meaning. This has to be valuable to us in our careers. It has to remember that teaching is collaborative. We work with our peers, we work in teams, we work with our students and recognize and integrate that into the framework. And in terms of being learner-centered, be learner-centered in terms of making sure that it focuses on our particular development, but also that it includes, it, inclu it, it encourages us and fosters us to be very learner-centric in our whole approach. So, the next step probably is, well, how do we integrate all of that, all of these values into an emerging framework? We don't have the answers yet, but we're hoping that you'll be able to help us to find some. One of the other things that um, was, came across very clear was that teaching isn't a linear process. And that given time, good teachers stop. They reflect. They look at the evidence. They take a decision. They move on. They reflect. They look at the evidence. And they move on. Now, sometimes that's not always possible for us to actually do. Time restricts us, um, the structures around us sometimes restrict us, but it's something that they said, bring back, you said, bring back into professional development, bring back that reflection, bring back that evidence base, and make it a very strong part of the framework for Ireland. And the other thing you said was, we're all different, please. It can't be a one-size-fits-all, because every one of us have particular pathways that we actually want to, to, to follow. And, re and you're, the framework that, that, that develops has got to take that into account. So no pressure then, okay. All right. And then it said, and remember also, that when I start as a teacher, I start as, a, as an... We've, we've called it in this particular version, we've called it a newcomer, but it means I'm new to teaching. And I start, and sometimes for some of us, it's, I walk in and I'm very confident. And then reality sets in a little bit later on. Sometimes I'm not that confident, and I build up my confidence. So there's, so there's a very different cohort. But one of the things about the actual research that we did is that there is a consensus across the sector that having supports in for those that are coming new to teaching is really, really important. 
And some of the recognition that happens, so I'm new to teaching and I'm trying to grasp the whole system, but then what do I do? I've delivered my first set of modules and maybe I've even done them twice and you know, it went well, I felt I'd done better the second time. And, and you come to that stage in, in your career where you say, well, you know, I'm willing to try new things now. So we're trying to capture it by looking at calling it a practitioner. And the words here, we need your help. We don't know what the right words are. But I'm trying to explain to you what we mean, and hopefully together we can find the right words to actually, um, to actually use. So at, at the practitioner stage, you're in teaching a few years, or a couple of years, you're getting a bit more confident, you're willing to try, you're perhaps contributing to module developments. And then, you, you, as your career pushes on, you may well become more in a mentoring role, you might take a position perhaps to, to lead a program team, to actually do some developments, and, and then you may well be actually a leader, a leader who actually, through new knowledge, is pushing out and saying, look what you can do, look what's possible. And I think this is some of the stuff that we have to build in and integrate into the professional development framework. And one of the other things that we learned from the accredited professional development approach was that we looked at what was already being delivered. And 40% of what you deliver was around teaching methods. About 15% was about reflective practice. You had, you also, building research skills, and the, and the fourth element was um, building digital capacity. So already the accredited programs that exist in Ireland have these particular characteristics. So we said, okay, what else has come through from what you've been saying to us? What else has come through? We looked at all the learning outcomes, but we didn't hear the, the conversation around it. So what else has come through? One of the things that came through was, you're very important. What you bring in to the classroom is really, really important. And I think that was really exemplified by our work with the heroes. These were individuals that brought into the classroom their own attitudes, beliefs, and they did something with it and that I think we need to make explicit as part of a framework, that we have to be conscious of what we ourselves are bringing into the classroom and how good and bad that actually impacts on our teaching. Another thing that came through was that th the sector itself is very diverse and it's changing rapidly. And the, the way that we're actually working now is can be quite different to the ways that we're working in five years. Pathways within institutions are changing. And we need time to stop and actually look at our professional identity at various times throughout our career and set goals and targets for what we actually might want to achieve. What do we want to do? So again, it's taking that time out explicitly as part of the framework to say, well, this is where I am now. This is where I think I'm actually going in this particular phase, and to actually have those sort of stop points to actually work towards. The other thing that came through, and I, this morning Joe talked to uh, about David Putnam, and he has been very influential um, in our board, and he also influenced a little bit about including this, although it came across very strongly from the sector as well. And he said to us at one stage, he said, I'm often criticized because I'm a film director, and what the hell do I know about teaching? And I still I talk about teaching. And I said, well, what do you say to them? And he says, well, I tell them that being a good film director is all about communication. And I would have thought, is not what teaching is about too. So I think we need to recognize that communication and professional communication and dialogue is a really key aspect of good teaching. And Look at the circumstances and the variety of states where we actually have to communicate. We're communicating from one to 500. We're communicating one to one. We're communicating in small groups. We're encouraging teamwork. We're communicating online. We're facilitating discussions online. We're communicating with industry. We communicate perhaps with media. There are huge amounts of communication that's happening. And most important, we're communicating with our colleagues and with our students. So professional communication has to be a key element of the actual framework. Professional knowledge and skills, and this is where all the teaching methodologies and the subject knowledges are perhaps are actually captured. And within this, we see it is very clear that there's two sides. 
when we were t around talking through the sector, we spoke to people that considered themselves teachers who happened to be engineers. And we also talked to people who considered themselves engineers who happened to be teachers. But if you're teaching engineering, you need to know engineering and you need to know teaching. So there's a need to develop and maintain your subject knowledge within your discipline area, within your professional area. So that has to be a key part of what you do. So that everything that you're actually doing in your classroom is relevant to the students when they go out to that workplace. We have to look outside and make sure we're keeping ourselves up to date with what's actually happening in, their, in, in the workplace and make sure that we're integrating all of that into our teaching. We also need to look at our teaching ourselves and the developments within our own disciplines and what's actually possible and what pedagogies are, are actually working best. We need to look at the evidence. We need to keep our own teaching up to date. And the final thing is, and there was a, we had a big debate about whether this should be put in explicitly or not. But when we actually read what you said, there was a very strong sense that this had to be made explicit right now. Per, the development of personal and professional digital capacity. In our consultations, there was a sense that, the, that those things digital were kind of seeping in without being explicit. And yet, in the, in, when the documentation came back to us, there's a very strong sense that, you know, we need to realize, we need to acknowledge we're now working and living in this digital world. And we need opportunities for our staff and for our students to actually develop skills for this digital world. And, to be quite, and so we're being quite explicit about the need to develop personal and professional digital capacity. And the way that it, we're kind of viewing it is through the, 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 the different areas that have been identified by the All Aboard project. Find and locate, identity and well-being. All of the different elements, so that would actually do it. And the other thing that you said is, is please, don't, don't make everything at level nine. Some of us, in terms of our digital literacy, need, need entry points, not at level nine, so that we can develop our skills from where we're actually at. So I think that's an important aspect of the framework that we need to integrate. And finally, the last thing you said was, please remember the context within which we're working. Please remember that we work within an institutional context. And if this is to work, we also need to support institutions to help make it work. So having listened to, to all of this, what our first step is, is that this is our first stab at interpreting what you have said. And we now need your help to see whether we've actually got it more or less right. And we'd really appreciate feedback. And I've actually left leaflets of the actual model and, and all the descriptions outside in reception at lunchtime, and it'll also be on our website. So we really would appreciate some feedback. Um, the second step is that as the feedback comes in, we're going to continue in partnership with the QQI, developing national guidelines along the lines of this. And we would hope to have a very draft copy of these out to institutions by the end of January, beginning of February. These are for consultation. This is where we actually need your help. Have we got to everything that needs to be included? Are there things we've missed? Are there things in there that shouldn't be in there? We need your help to actually write these guidelines properly. Um, once the guidelines come back in, we're also going, at the same time, we're developing institutional guidelines for the enhancement of teaching and learning. And these guidelines is actually positioning professional development as part of an enhancement suite for institutions. And we're developing guidelines just to support institutions in terms of how you might do the, the guideline, or you might work towards the enhancement of teaching and learning, whether you're a program team, or it might be at a departmental level, or it might be at an institutional level. And they'll go out to the, the, they'll go out to the sector, sometimes around, around March, April, and they'll come back in around June. And then we would hope that some institutions would agree to work with us to pilot some of the guidelines in the new academic year to see if they work. This is the very start. This is just one small step in the process. And I think we have to go slowly. And I think by working together, 
we can make sure that we have a professional development framework that suits our needs and our contexts. Thank you. One of the comfy chairs. Hmm? You can sit down on a comfy chair now, oh, Terry, <laughs> and I'll join you in a second. Um, I, I just think that there's so much there to reflect on. Um, I'm really grateful to Terry for her leadership and to all of you for the roles that you've played in helping to inform this process. Um, the, it's, it's very important, I think, now that we take some questions and answers, but I'm conscious that this format is not ideal for really getting involved in a kind of an in-depth discussion. So please see this as part of this ongoing conversation. Um, but let's take a few questions from the floor while we can now, uh, before we close off before lunch. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank Is you, that Barry? Uh, Barry, yes. Barry O'Callaghan. Um, I chair the Leading for Learning group with the Second Level Principals and Deputies Association. Uh, just a few comments, uh, Terry. Um, CPD, we all know what it means. We all are very versed with, with the three letters and what exactly it means. Um, there's a real danger, certainly at second level and possibly at third level, that it becomes a tick box. And Terry, you, you alluded to that. You mentioned that, that term. Um, doing courses and building up ours. In fact, there's a teaching council requirement coming in very shortly at second level. And the real danger there is that teachers will go off and do their courses and no one will be any wiser. Um, I like to refer to Mike Hughes, and Terry, you're familiar with the work of Mike Hughes, who's a UK-based, calls himself a trainer, but he works with teachers. And I think the CPD um, understanding that he has will have relevance for everyone that's a teacher. His CPD is creating professional dialogue. Yeah. Because if CPD does not result in a professional dialogue within the profession, then what is it? And um, that's my first point. My second point, it's one that I made to Sarah and Terry and Joe um, over the uh, coffee break, and that relates to trans the trans uh, transitions, rather. Um, as many of you will know, the second level system um, is, I suppose, we could generously say stuck. We see junior cycle reform, which is quite a modest reform by international standards, bogged down half of the profession and more uh, as, say, as witnessed by the ASCI decisions. Um, and we're not getting into politics here, but they're not willing or able to move from where they are. There's a real danger that if you get your act together, and I, uh, this term sounds awful, if you're very successful in what you do at third level in developing pedagogy and teaching and learning, there's a real danger that, uh, that unless second level moves with you, second level is going to be so far behind that when people come to third level and your engine is purring and ticking over, that a second level, the second level people coming in will be so far, so far left behind. So it's, I think it's really important, and Terry, you know this from conversations that we have had, that as you move forward, that the second level system must not be left behind. It must be engaged in some meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I, I think the avoiding of the bureaucratic tick box exercise, which is your first point, is something that uh, we've all been very cognizant of in, in terms of designing something that's really going to be authentic. The links to second level, I think, have been reiterated by you, Barry, and that really does echo an awful lot of the stuff we, Joe and I talked about earlier on, and you'll see echoes of that later on today. Terry, do you want to speak to any of that? No, but I, I, I know that uh, Barry and I have been having um, a lot of conversations in this space. And, and Barry, I'll throw the question back at you. How best to engage with, teachers, with teachers at second level? We've, we've talked, we, yes, we talked to the teaching council, but how do we get that engagement? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer, but I, <laughs> I do know, I mean, a lot, with lots of professional dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do know that, that um, you, I think the fact that the third level that you have this body called the Forum for Teaching and, Learning a third, uh, Teaching and Learning a Third Level, or whatever its proper title is, the fact that you have it at third level is a huge pointer for us at second level because nothing like this formally exists at second level. So perhaps the success of what you're doing will, will and the engagement then with the department and the powers that be can, I think the fact that if, you, if you're successful, then we can point and say, listen, there's a model that second level can, can look at and, and build success upon. So I think engagement, um, I think connection, I think lots of dialogue with us, but also with the powers that be. 
um, to ensure that the, the success that you have at third level carries down into second level and connects also with primary level because pedago yeah. good pedagogy is good pedagogy. Good learning is That's effective right. learning is effective learning, be it for a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old. Thank you, Barry. I think we'll definitely reflect on those uh, ideas and encouragements, I think, as we go forward. Is there a question from anyone else? Oh. Uh, Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the professional development framework. I'm dying to um, you know, get more involved and to see it worked out and to see it used as a tool, a support tool for educators a tool to help us clarify, along with our institution, what our goals are, um, so that we can be all singing the same hymn sheet. One thing that um, I am interested in, um, and it's only one thing, because lots of the other things you've covered, I think, really well in the presentation, and thanks for that, Terry. My concern and question, I suppose, is will there be a room in this framework to um, acknowledge professional projects rather than professional research in the discipline? You know, so professional um, barristers coming in from the field and talking to students in relation to um, a brief they're currently working on, the value of that. An architect coming off the site and coming in with a set of plans. You know, it's not discipline research, obviously, yeah. uh, but they're extremely active in the space mm -hmm. and perhaps will never be researchers. Um, but at the same time, that what they bring to the learning space is, is essential in many cases. That's an excellent point, Terry. Did you want to say? Well, I just anything? think that the in terms of the, the model is, is the first piece. And then it's how you actually try and, and make sure that all of those who actually want to actually integrate in with the framework, how that happens afterwards is, is the more challenging piece. But the whole idea is, is that it is as inclusive as possible. Yeah, I think that we'd be doing a real disservice to yeah. the sector if those kinds of projects and methods of engagement weren't incorporated and recognised very clearly. I think that's something that's come very clearly from the, the sector already. But thank you for reminding us and, of it. And the other thing is, is of course, that, that people will be starting at different points where, you know, once the framework emerges. So one of the, the big jobs of work that we'll be doing in the next few months is, is as alongside the development of the guidelines, how do we also develop processes to enable people to be able to position self, themselves along the framework. So. Yeah. Do other countries have that facility for recognising uh, professional projects on frameworks? Does anybody know? I actually didn't come across it. No, I haven't either, but, but I haven't done a lot yeah. of research. So it's just curious. I mean, it might be something... It could be something exciting and innovative, or it could be something that we'd be in trouble for. But anyway, we can. But we should keep it on the table for discussion and see, and see how we can carve yeah. it out. Yeah. And I think that that also raises another important point, though, and that is, what is made explicit? I mean, we don't want to create something that's going to be to straitjacket institutions, um, no. and yet at the same time, there are certain really core ideas and values um, and um, dimensions that will need to be made really explicit and so it's it's striking that balance and thinking through that and I think you're quite right um, because something that looks perfectly um, uh, logical in one context can be very contentious in another and I think we just need to be very cognizant of that so thank you is there another question that I think we have time for one more yeah Are we on you Terry yeah hi Brian how are you keeping um my, my kind of take on all of this is I'm curious as to where the whole digital technology thing is going as regards all of this, you know. And more importantly, I suppose it's, it's a question for you guys in terms of what influence does the forum have on the department in terms of us rolling out more digital technology in the institutions? I mean, what kind of role can you guys play in that? I mean, does the minister listen, for instance? I mean, I, I'm talking in terms of finance, really, you know, that we need to, we need to upgrade an awful lot of the institutes in terms of our digital capacity. Okay, yeah, okay perhaps I'll just answer that. One of our pre-specified projects, Brian, which is initiating actually on the ground on the first, of, probably around the first of January, is actually to do a review of the current infrastructure within institutions. And the actual scope for this project was designed by the actual sector itself, so the, the criteria in terms of reference were, were agreed. And that's going to take nine months. And I think, again, because the information isn't there, this will be the first time that there will actually be information, real information, about the infrastructure across higher education. And I think we'll be much better placed then 
to see where we are and if we are to develop what actually needs to be done. I'm going to draw the discussion to a close. There's going to be plenty more time to interrogate Terry and me about how we made sense of all of your consultations. Um, enormous thanks again to all of you for the role that you played, and particular thanks to Terry Maguire for presenting it in the way that she did. Thank you so much. Thank you.